Well, good day. I might just say that again. Well, good day. Not sure if it worked or not. Um, hope it's all well. So I'm just doing something a bit different rather than um, do the normal rant and talk to people. I just want to start reading from a book. Um, this one sort of jumped out at me today. I was looking, actually looking for a different book to read, but I misplaced it. And so I thought, well, it's an interesting book. It's not necessarily something that I believe from cover to cover. As I scan through a few pages, I did see that there are some things here to do with the hollow earth, which might have actually more clues to do with the flat earth, and perhaps even give us more information about the truth of the flat earth, than perhaps it is also hollow, and perhaps there's a lot of secrets about the North Pole and so on. Um, I don't believe a lot of things they say about the South Pole, I don't believe there is a South Pole, of course, that's just me. Um, the book is called Secret of the Ages by Brinsley Le Poir Trench. Well, it's also called UFOs from Inside the Earth. This is the sort of stuff I used to read many years back. The book was written in 1974. It's dedicated to Mildred, his dear friend. Mildred Allen Spong, who, who for over a quarter of a century has been a source of inspiration and joy to him. The contents, I don't normally read the contents of a book. It's basically introductions, part one, the case for Atlantis, with eight chapters. Part two is the case for Hollow Earth, with 11 chapters. Part three, the case for inner Earth people, with six, seven or eight, like 11 or so, 12 chapters, um, with illustrations in it. And it starts off with a little introduction that says, Alice laughed. There's no use trying, she said. One can't believe impossible things. I dare say you haven't had much practice, said the Queen. When I was younger, I always did it for half an hour a day. Why, sometimes I've believed as many as six impossible things before breakfast. Lewis Carroll through the looking glass. Um, there's many acknowledgements. The main one is Mr. Raymond A. Palmer, editor and publisher of Flying Sources. His client permission to quote extensively and to supply considerable source material, including the satellite photographs which were produced in the magazine. And then there's many other acknowledgements as well, which if you ever get yourself a copy of the book, feel free to read through them all. A special word of thanks to Mr. Egerton Sykes, who kindly provided data on traces of Atlantean cities on the Atlantic Ocean as this book was about to go to press, which I was delighted to incorporate. For the introduction, I really need these to be able to read. Anyone who puts forward an idea that is contrary to all accepted scientific views and to long established beliefs is a suitable target for ridicule. And we know it. However, much more eminent people than myself over the centuries have received the full treatment of scorn and derision. Often, though, their ideas and discoveries have eventually been vindicated and proved correct. Galileo Galilei is an example from the past, and Emmanuel Velikovsky in our own times. In this book, it is proposed to present first the case for the reality of Atlantis, the lost continent. Many other writers have tried to do this before me, but it is an essential part of my case for the hollow earth that follows. Possibly I'll produce some data and photo unknown information about Atlantis. I firmly believe that Atlantis existed in a continent that my researchers will convince you of its reality. Secondly, I will be presenting proof for the Earth being hollow, with entrances into the interior from both the north and south polar areas. Other smaller entrances scattered about the Earth's surface leading into great tunnel systems, connecting with the cavern world inside the Earth, will be mentioned. The ancients built these great tunnel systems, and as you'll see in the first part of this book, they live both inside and on the surface of the Earth. You see, our planet, like all others, is really a great spaceship sailing through the ocean of space. Inside our ship are myriads of passages, vast halls and even great cities. We are just living on the deck of our ship unaware of all the life and activity going on, literally under our feet. This is now the most cl closely guarded international secret of the ages. See, this is what people used to believe in the olden days. <laughs> they lived on a planet sailing through space. The 
I'll have to bear with me. I'm a little shaky. Uh, getting old. Thirdly, based on the conviction that a hollow earth really exists, reasons will be produced to suggest that a large proportion of the unidentified flying objects, more popularly known as flying saucers, emanate from the Earth's interior. Now, it must be admitted that in one of my earlier books, scorn was poured on the hollow earth theory, then believed by, in only by a minority of ufologists. You see, had I been educated, along with millions of other people, believed that the Earth had a liquid molten core, this is no longer accepted scientific thinking. Once this fact became known to me, I read and researched deeply into this fascinating subject and came to the conclusion that the Earth was really hollow. It always takes courage to amend your views, especially when they've been expressed publicly in print. We should all be adaptable to new ideas, and if the evidence is there, not be afraid to bring it forward, even if it runs contrary to what we've previously written. The contents of this book do not contradict anything in my previous ones, with the above exception. I still firmly consider that some of the UFOs come from other worlds in our physical universe and some from invisible ones in another order of matter, too. Some, too, may come from bases under the sea, an idea proposed by the late Ivan T. Sanderson in his remarkable book, Invisible Residence. It should also be stated that the hollow earth theory did not originate in my little grey cells. Several books were written shortly after the turn of the century advocating this idea, notably two by Marshall B. Gardner and William Reed. A lot of the questions that both Gardner and Reed asked have still not been answered. The questions raised by these two learned gentlemen, coupled with more modern evidence and satellite photographs of the popular areas, will be the main basis of my argument for a hollow earth. However, as a curtain raiser, we're first going to have a look at the legendary Atlantis. And this has a lot to do with the hollow earth, and this author hopes to prove to you that Atlantis is not just a legend, but a reality. Part one, case for Atlantis. And we better lubricate the trope one more time, because <clears throat> I'm really not in a good way. <sighs> Feeling better already. The location of Atlantis. Thousands of books have been written in many languages about the lost continent of Atlantis. Indeed, according to Colonel, Abrahimi, writing in the Shadow of Atlantis, there are more than 25,000 volumes dedicated to Atlantology alone in one library in Paris. Incidentally, Abrahimi's book was published in 1938, and there may be quite a few more by now. Plato has preserved for mankind the history of Atlantis in his dialogues, Timaeus and Hutius. However, as these were regarded as examples of his more popular rather than serious works, his narrative about the sinking of Atlantis has been regarded as a fable by many critics. Nevertheless, there are so many similarities on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean in regard to sun worship, pyramid building, symbols and hieroglyphics on rocks, semantics, buildings, um, culture, arts, and traditions, that when studying the whole question of Atlantis in depth, you're left with no choice but to accept that there was once such a tremendous civilization which was obliterated in a great catastrophe or a series of catastrophes. That in that is, unless you're the most hardened sceptic with a built-in mechanism that won't allow you to believe in something until it's actually before your eyes. Ignatius Donnelly, in his comprehensive and scholarly work, Atlantis, the Antediluvian World, commented upon that type of person in these words. The fact that the story of Atlantis was for thousands of years regarded as a fable proves nothing. There is an unbelief which grows out of ignorance, as well as a scepticism which is born of intelligence. The people nearest to the past are not always those who are best confirmed informed concerning the past. For a thousand years it was believed that the legends of the buried cities of Pompeii and the Herculaneum were myths. They were spoken of as the fabulous cities. For a thousand years the educated world did not credit the accounts given by Herodotus of the wonders of the ancient civilizations of the Nile and Chaldea. He was called the father of liars. Even Plutarch sneered at him. Now, in the language of Frederick Schlegel, the deeper the more comprehensive the researchers of the moderns have been, the more their regard and esteem for Herodotus has increased. Buckle says, his minute information about Egypt and Asia Minor is admitted by all geographers. Another more recent example that we can given is the discovery made by amateur archaeologist Dr. Heinrich Schleimann. He unearthed his Troy, which few people believe to have existed. If we go back to the furthest historical and traditional records of the human race, the conclusion is reached that in exceedingly ancient times, civilization, culture, art, 
commerce and colonization were originated and subsequently maintained by a mysterious race of white and bearded men of fair complexion who evidently held sway over most of the earth, but of whom history preserves few definite traces. The veil of time has descended and almost obliterated their memory, yet they and the vast complex culture they created did exist. Evidence supporting and confirming this is surprisingly abundant if you know how and where to locate it. The sources include the traditions, folklore and early literature of many nations, both in the New World and in the Old, and sculptured edifices, edifices of great age. Where was Atlantis situated? That is a question that has puzzled Atlantologists for centuries. Many theories have been put forward. The Atlantean associations with certain special areas and special monumental edifices have been pretty certainly established and is now possible to trace their activities to many parts of the world. It is a most remarkable fact, however, that the greatest or most abundant traces of this ancient white race occur in the lands surrounding the Atlantic Ocean, especially in South America and in the Andean region of Peru, Bolivia and Colombia. The main focal centre of the culture seems, from many points of view, to have been located somewhere between West Africa and Brazil, or eastwards of the West Indies. It is obviously of fundamental importance to prove or disprove the existence of these long-vanished lands, since the possibility of their former existence would, if irrevocably established, clearly alter our conception of the origin and antiquity of civilization. The following material seems to support the belief that in the comparatively very recent past, geologically speaking, there existed a large landmass, landmass or several land bridges connecting the present transatlantic continents in the Atlantic Ocean, and that these lands founded through a great natural upheaval well within the human being. <coughs> These lands founded through a great natural upheaval well within the human period. The story of Atlantis, first popularised by Plato, has attracted the attention of many serious-minded scholars down the ages since Greek and Roman times. The conclusions reached by writers upon this subject are most diverse. Some staunchly supported the hypothesis, amply proved by geological and paleontological however you're happy to manage my testimony, that a very real Atlantean continent existed until comparatively recent times. Others, ridiculing that idea, advanced counter-arguments disproving, in their estimation, the recent existence of any extensive land mass in the Atlantic. The available evidence, however, when reviewed dispassionately, undoubtedly confirms the former and the very recent existence in the Atlantic of one or more land masses. Dr. Lewis Spence ably surveyed earlier notions about the lost continent in his book, The Problem of Atlantis. Many of the older geologists were in favour of the idea of an Atlantean continent. Lyle confessed it to its likelihood, though he could not see in the Atlantic islands traces of a mid-Atlantic ridge. This, of course, has now been found. Buffon dated the separation of the new and old ones from the catastrophe Atlantis. In 1846, Forbes declared his belief in the former existence of a bridge of islands in the North Atlantic, and in 1856, he attempted to show the necessity of a similar connection from the testimony of paleontological history. In 1860, Unger tried to explain the likeness between the fossil flora of Europe and the living flora of Asia by virtue of the Atlantean hypothesis, and Kunz, who was struck with the case of tropical seedless banana, occurring at once in Asia and in the America before the discovery of the latter continent by Columbus, saw in this a strange evidence of the truth of the Atlantean theory. Professor E. Hull in the Suboceanic Physiography of the North Atlantic wrote, the flora and fauna of the two hemispheres support the geologic theory that there was a common centre in the Atlantic where organic life began, and that prior to the glacial epoch, great land bridges north and south spanned the Atlantic Ocean. French geologists have, for some unknown reason, always been positively sympathetic towards Atlantis, and Pierre Termier is no exception. Termier included a vast amount of evidence for the reality of the sunken continent in a paper entitled Atlantis which he read to the assembled members of the Institut Oceanographique of Paris on 30th of November 1912. A general account of Termier's paper also appeared in the annual report of the Smithsonian Institute for 1915. Here is a summary. Termier first pictures the Atlantic emptied of its waters. According to the evidence of soundings, he tells us we should, looking at it from above, see two great depressions or valleys extending north and south parallel with the shores of the old and new worlds. The parallel with the shores of the, the, the Western Valley, extending the length of the American coast, is the larger and deeper of the two and descends more than 6,000 metres below the present sea level. The eastern sea level, along the European and African coastline, 
while apparently narrower and shallower, is more hilly, with numerous submerged peaks resembling those of the Canary and Madeira Islands. Separating those two longitudinal, longitudinal depressions is a central elevated zone known as the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. It is roughly a shape conforming to the general shape of the Atlantic Basin. It begins at Greenland and ends at the 70th parallel south latitude. The Azores evidently lie on the line of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, the nine islands of which forming the group cover a total area of length of about 500 miles. Their aggregate area is prolonged very far beneath the waves. Termier then stresses the fact that the eastern region of the Atlantic bed is in the Great Volcanic Zone. In the Europe, in the Euro-African Depression, submarine volcanoes are abundant. Most of the islands in this region are composed largely of lava. The same phenomenon occurs in the Western or American Depression. This would seem to indicate that in the bottom of the Atlantic Basin there is a certain mobility of the crust. It is indeed still in movement in the extreme eastern zone for a space of about 1,875 miles in breadth, which comprises Iceland, the Azores, Madeira, the Canaries and the Cape Verde Islands. It is the most unstable zone on the Earth's surface, where at any moment unrecorded submarine cataclysms may be taking place. Termier believed that the land masses in the Atlantic Ocean were submerged in a series of cataclysms spread over thousands of years, leaving a few islands still above water. I gave the same view in my book, Men Among Men, published in 1962. He stated, Geologically speaking, Plato's theory of Atlantis is highly probable. It is entirely reasonable to believe that long after the opening of the Strait of Gibraltar, certain of these emerged islands still existed, and among them a marvellous island separated from the African continent by a chain of other smaller islands. One thing alone remains to be proved, that the cataclysm which caused this island to disappear was subsequent to the appearance of man in Western Europe. The cataclysm is undoubted. Did men then live who could withstand the reaction and transmit the memory of it? That is the whole question. I do not believe it at all in insoluble, but it seems to me that neither geology nor zoology will solve it. These two sciences appear to have told all they can, and it is from anthropology, from ethnography, and lastly from oceanography that are now awaiting the final answer. Since Termia read his important paper, The Science of Radiocarbon Dating of Organic Remains and the Progress of Oceanographic Research have amply confirmed his beliefs and expectations, and in recent years have irrefutably have shown irrefutably that large-scale topographical alterations have occurred in many areas of the Atlantic Basin within exceedingly recent geological times. Man must have witnessed the convulsion of nature. After reviewing the statements and evidence amassed on the Atlantis question, Spence, in another of his books, The History of Atlantis, wrote, From such evidence we may be justified in concluding that the hypothesis of a formerly existing landmass in the Atlantic is by no means based on mere surmise. The fact that geologists of distinction have risked their reputations by testifying in no uncertain manner to the reality of a former Atlantic continent should surely give pause to those who impatiently refuse to examine the prob probabilities of the argument so ably upheld. But the most significant consideration which emerges is that this modern expert evidence is almost entirely in favour of the existence of a comparatively recent landmass or masses in the Atlantic. And if we take into consideration the whole of the... I'd read this smaller writing. The whole of the evidence and the nature of its sources, it does not seem beyond the bounds of human credence that at a period no earlier than that mentioned by Plato in his Critias, viz. 9600 BC, this ancient continent was still in partial existence, but in process of disintegration. That an island of considerable size, the remnant, perhaps, of the African shelf, still lay opposite the entrance to the Mediterranean, and that lesser islands connected it with Europe, Africa, and perhaps with our shores. Soundings taken at the Atlantic by various admiralty authorities have revealed the existence of a great bank, or elevated region, commencing near the coast of Ireland, traversed by the 53rd parallel, and extending in a southerly direction, embracing the Azores to the neighbourhood of French Guiana and the estuary of the Amazon and Para rivers. This is the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, the average depth of which below sea level is about 9,000 feet, and the same above the floor of the Atlantic. These figures have been obtained by various oceanographic expeditions, such as those of the Hydra, Porcupine and Challenger, the US ships Dolphin and Gettysburg, and the German ships Meteor and Gazelle. The evidence of the flora and fauna on the island strewn along this largely submerged ridge, such as the Azores, is complementary to that derived from deep sea soundings and sub-oceanic geology, and some of this is worthy of special mention. Professor R. F. Schaaf, in a paper entitled 
some remarks on the Atlantis problem, read to the Royal Irish, Irish Academy, clearly showed that the larger mammalia of the Atlantic islands were not imported thither in historical times. The same authority added that his attempts to trace the history of the origins on the islands points rather to some of them, at any rate, having reached the latter in the normal way, which is by a land connection with Europe. Spence, in the history of Atlantis, mentions Professor Simroth, who, writing about the similarity between the slugs of Spain, Portugal, North Africa and the Canaries, concluded there was probably a broad land connection between these four regions, and that it must have persisted until comparatively recent times. In his Testacea Atlantica, T.V. Wollaston, drew attention to the fact that the Mediterranean element in the Molluscan fauna of the Atlantic Isles was more noticeable in the Canaries than in the other groups of islands, and boldly stated that the Canaries are the last remnants of a land once more or less continuous with Africa, which had been colonised by mollusks over tracts now submerged. In this chapter, an impressive list of authorities have been quoted or voicing their considered view that land mass or masses must have existed in the Atlantic up until quite recently. In his excellent book, The Shadow of Atlantis, Colonel Brahini mentions the research of a German scientist, Major K. Billau, who, basing himself on the newest maps and exact data of the Geographical Institute of Berlin, drew a magnificent map of the bottom of the Atlantic in the region of the Azores. As a result of this map and the data contained in it, the German scientist established the truth of Plato's account as follows, quoting from Brahim's book. Deep under the ocean's waters, Atlantis is now reposing, and only its highest summits are still visible in the shape of the Azores. Its cold and hot springs, described by the ancient authors, are still flowing there as they flowed many millennia ago. The mountain lakes of Atlantis have been transformed now into submerged ones. If we follow exactly Plato's indication and seek the site of poisoned onus, among the half-submerged summits of the Azores, we will find it to the south of the island of Dolabarada. There, upon an eminence in the middle of the larger and comparatively straight valley, which was protected from the winds, stood the capital, the magnificent poisoned on us. But we cannot see that mighty centre of an unknown prehistoric culture. <coughs> Between us and the city of the Golden Gate is a layer of water two miles deep. It is strange that the scientists have sought Atlantis everywhere, but have given the least attention to this spot, which, after all, was clearly indicated by Plato. Ooh, chapter one done. Slowly relaxing. Chapter two is the Bar Flung Empire. It is a fact that all known accounts of Atlantis whether Plato's famous narrative or the many traditional and mythological variants make it the site of an ancient and powerful civilization. Several writers mentioned that Atlantis was derived into ten great kingdoms, and so it would be reasonable to suppose that more than one marvellous city lies below, beneath the ocean waves. In the last chapter, we referred to the researchers and the map compiled by Major K. Villar. However, Egerton Sykes has furnished me with some data on the sighting of a city beneath the waves of the Atlantic during the war. Towards the end of 1942, when the pressure on the Allies was at its greatest, aircraft of American origin were ferried over the Atlantic from Natal in Brazil to Dakar in French West Africa, adjacent to the site of the historical city of CERN. The journey from Dakar to Egypt was performed by easy stages, and most of the pilots managed to get a few days' leave in Cairo before returning. One evening in the turf club in Cairo, a pilot was overheard chatting to a friend at the bar about a strange sight he had seen on the flight over. On being approached by Egerton Sykes, he explained that in mid-Atlantic, over the Atlantic Ridge, he saw the remains of a city on the western slope of a submarine mountain. He explained that this was only possible because at the time of his flight, the rays of the sun were striking the water at an angle such that they penetrated diagonally to a considerable distance, something which would only occur once in a thousand flights or more. Unfortunately, the pilot returned to pick up another craft the following day and it was not possible to contact him again. He may possibly still be alive, but one fears not, as no further report has ever been received. Another and completely different city was sighted underwater near the Cape Verde Islands by Captain Anderson of Copenhagen in 1929. The site was off Boa Vista Island, where a marketplace was found by a Danish diver. The incident was reported in Atlantis for April 1949. In support of Villau's claim, Captain R. Dahl reported, I wonder if that's rolled up reported finding traces of a sunken area near the surface of Fael in 1949. This was recorded in June of that year in Atlantis. Egerton Sykes ended his special report in these words. 
There are Atlantean remains all around the Atlantic, as also on the flanks of the Great Atlantic Ridge. As we progress with oceanography, there's no doubt that some of them will be photographed from submarines or other underwater craft. All the evidence needed is available, only we must search for it with care. More recently, what appears to be the remains of another Atlantean city have been discovered on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean, off the coast of the Bahamas, near Babini. The Times, on Wednesday 30th of June 1971, carried a report from the science correspondent about the evidence that had been gathered at the site by M. Dmitri Rebikov, the French underwater explorer. Huge stone blocks about 15 feet to 20 square feet looked as if they'd been assembled together by man to form a harbour. It is also known that there are pillars going down from an unknown depth in the muck on the seabed, and that these support the stone blocks at their corners. More evidence that it is man-built evidence. Edifice. In his very interesting book, The Riddle of the Earth, Commins Bowman, writing under the name of Appian Way, remarked, For many, the most important point in Plato's account of Atlantis is that it was the mother both of the Egyptian and Athenian civilization. For well, there was a time, Solon, said the priest of Sais in Egypt, when the city which is now Athens was first in war and was preeminent for the excellence of the laws and is said to perform the noblest deeds and have had the fairest constitution of which, end, of which tradition tells under the face of heaven. Minerva founded your city a thousand years before ours. Beaumont went on to quote from Plato as follows. Afterwards there occurred violent earthquakes and floods, and in a single day and night of rain, all your warlike men in a body sunk into the earth, and the isle of Atlantis in like manner disappeared and was sunk beneath the sea. Atlantis was alluded to in one way or another by several other ancient authors, such as Theopompus, circa 378-300 BC, who was noted for his accuracy. Alien, in the third volume of his Varia Hist, says that Theopompus, who lived at Chios, stated that Atlantis was inhabited by men of gigantic size who were very long-lived and that gold was more abundant than iron. The influence of Atlantean civilization on ancient Egypt, the Babylonians, the Phoenicians, the Greeks and the Romans, and even on the Scandinavians on the east side of Atlantic is quite remarkable. The same influence penetrated in the other direction in what are now parts of the United States as well as Central America and into large parts of South America, especially in Bolivia, Brazil, Colombia and Peru. The Atlantean Empire covered a great portion of the earth. Donnelly, in Atlantis, the Antediluvian world, points out that the ancient religion in Atlantis was sun worship. The Egyptians worshipped the sun under the name of Ra. The Hindus worshipped the sun under the name of Rama, while the great festival of the sun of the Peruvians was called Rami. He goes on to state that the gods of the Greeks on Mount Olympus were really Atlantean kings, and much the same goes for the gods of the Romans and Phoenicians. The Greeks, too, with the Greeks, too young to have shared in the religion of Atlantis, but preserving some memory of that great country and its history, proceeded to convert its kings into gods and to depict Atlantis itself as the heaven of the human race. Thus we find a great scholar or nature worship in the elder nations, while Greece is nothing but an incongruous jumble of gods and goddesses who are born and eat and drink and make love and ravish and steal and die, and who are worshipped as immortal in the presence of very monuments that testify to their death. Later on, Donnelly, quoting from Murray's mythology, wrote, Another proof that the gods of the Greeks were but the deified kings of Atlantis is found in the fact that the gods were not looked upon as having created the world. They succeeded up to the management of a world already in existence. After discussing the way of life in Atlantis, Donnelly continued, This blessed land answers to the description of Atlantis. It was an island full of wonders. It lay spread out in the ocean like a disc with the mountains rising from it, Murray's mythology. On the highest point of this mountain dwelt Zeus, the king, while the mansions of the other deities were arranged upon the plateau or in ravines lower down the mountain. These deities, including Zeus, were twelve in number. Zeus, or Jupiter, Hera, or Juno, Poseidon, or Neptune, Demeter, or Ceres, Apollo, Artemis, or Diana, Hephaestos, Hephaestos, or Vulcan, Pallas, Athena, or Minerva, Ares, or Mars, Aphrodite or Venus, Hermes or Mercury, and Hestia or Vesta. These are doubtless the twelve gods from the Egyptians, from whom the Egyptians derived their kings. Where two names are given to a deity in the above list, the first name is that bestowed by the Greeks, and the last given that given by the Romans. Incidentally, you'll note that Apollo is a god in both the Greek and Roman pantheons. Although there is a Mount Olympus in Greece, Donnelly states that the Greek tradition located the island which Olympus was situated in the far west in the ocean beyond Africa, on the western boundary of the known world. 
where the sun shone when it had ceased to shine on Greece, and where the mighty Atlas held up the heavens. And Plato tells us that the land where Poseidon Atlantis rules was Atlantis. Far away to the west, across what is now the Atlantic Ocean, lies the New World. It's a strange fact that the sign of the swastika, one of the oldest symbols in the world, which Hitler debased by reversing and adopting as a symbol for his Nazi party, is found on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean. Rohini wrote, We are surprised also by the resemblance between some American sacred symbols and the corresponding symbols of the ancient Europeans. We see, for instance, the sign of the swastika not only on the most ancient Aryan monuments, but also on the prehistoric American ones. The head of the Gorgon, the symbol of divine knowledge, we can meet with, not only on the classical monuments, but also in Mexican ruins and on the inscrutable stone of Chavin, a magnificent relic of the Tijuana Code culture. And later on, Professor Leo Fabonius has, has established some resemblances between the mysteries, mysterious Estruscans, 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 and certain Indian tribes. It seems likely that a great deal of ancient European folklore was borrowed from the prehistoric Europeans from certain ancient American races, the Atlanteans, in this case serving as a bridge between the European and Americans. It is of interest to note that Pastor Jurgens Benelt has recently suggested that Atlantis lay in the North Sea on the island of Heligoland. This theory is partly based on the premise that the old name for Heligoland was Atland. Peter Colissimo, in his book Timeless Earth, wrote, On the other hand, there are Ameri Am Amerindian legends of an Aztlan, which was involved in a catastrophe much earlier than that of the Medinet Habu inscriptions, and the proponents of Nordic Atlantis have difficulty explaining the references by Plato and Theopompus to a land beyond the Pillars of Hercules. However, as Col Colissimo adds, our verdict on the Spinuth's theory must therefore be that, while we cannot accept that Heligoland and Atlantis are identical, it is quite possible that the last Atlanteans of Northern Europe had their headquarters in the region he describes. Brazil has great connection with Atlantis, H.T. Wilkins in Mysteries of Ancient South America wrote. I, or Royal Brazil, is the name given to the old Irish legends who have lost golden world. The Atlanteans of old were well versed in occult matters and knew that a catastrophe of overwhelming consequences was imminent and sent forth bearded white men from the Western Empire to higher Brazil to civilise the savage Indians of Central America, Colombia, Peru and Bolivia in South America. In the first chapter, a brief reference was made to these bearded white men, Rahini tells us. The legends of the American races and tribes concerning great reformers, leaders and missionaries who from time to time appeared among the natives also sustain a hypothesis of the cultural mission of the Atlanteans in the prehistoric world, where there were, there were it seems, eight such reformers. In Peru, Menko Capac, Viracocca, and Pacacacamac. In Colombia, Bochica, among the Tupis, Tupan. In Yucatan, Itzemna, or Zemna. In Mexico, Quetzalcoatl, called in Guatemala, Ucamax. And in Yucatan, Ucalpna. And in Brazil and Paraguay, Zoom, called by the Caribs, Tamu, and by the Arabacs, Camu, and by the Carriers, Caboy. The Peruvian myth concerning Viracocca resembles the Colombian myth concerning Bocica. All these men, or gods, were sages, all came from some unknown land to the east of America, all wore long beards, all were white-skinned, and their end was everywhere the same. Their mission fulfilled, the sages mysteriously disappeared, promising to return to their beloved people later on. In all these Central and South American legends are hidden, it seems, the same fact. From time to time, Atlantean missionaries appeared in America, and their activity was clothed clothed later on by poetry and religion. I can mention in favour of this hypothesis the following fact. One of the above-named reformers, Quetzalcoatl, introduced into Mexico the cult of Tlaloc, or the Mexican Poisedon, who was the god of the sea, water and rains. We know that the cult of Poisedon was the most important in Atlantis, or Poisedonus. All this once again indicates the tremendous influence and impact of the Atlantean culture in prehistoric times. In its heyday, Atlantis must have been an empire of such an extent and power as this world has never known since. Oh, chapter three, a discovery greater than Troy. <sighs> Drinking a stout to stay stout. In 1929, a map was discovered in the Sultan's Palace in Constantinople, 
signed by a Turkish handman called Manpiri ibn Habi Mehmed. Haji Mehmed. It was dated 1513 and is known as the Pari Rias map. The word Rias means admirable. The whole tremendous story of this fascinating map is to be found in Professor Charles Hapwood's book, Maps of the Ancient Sea Kings, Evidence of Advanced, advanced Civilization in the Ice Age. Hapgood wrote, No more was heard of it until, by a series of curious chances, it aroused attention in Washington, D.C. in 1956. A Turkish naval officer had brought a copy of the map to the U.S. Navy Hydrographic Office as a gift. Although unknown to him, facsimiles already existed in the libraries of Conquest and other leading libraries in the United States. The map had been referred to a cartographer on the staff, M.I. Walters. Subsequently, Walters passed the map to a friend, Captain Arlington H. Mallory, who had much experience in studying old maps. There were, at first, three points of interest. One, this map differed from all other maps of the America drawn in the 16th century, in that it showed South America and Africa in correct relative longitudes. Perry Rears stated that parts of the map had been based on the one drawn by Columbus, and Mallory considered that part of the map showed places on the coast of Queen Maud Land in Antarctica, now hidden under the ice cap. This last point implied that the coast had been mapped before the ice appeared. In any case, this was considered truly fantastic as the Antarctic continent was only discovered in the early 19th century. Other scientists and cartographers were called in by Mallory, including the Reverend Daniel L. Lineham, director of the West Don Observatory of Boston College, and the Reverend Francis Haven, director of the Georgetown University Observatory. The Reverend Lineham and Mr. Wells has joined Mallory in a radio panel discussion sponsored by Georgetown University. Subsequently, Professor Charles Hapgood started a study course with his students at Keene State College of the University of New Hampshire to investigate the Piri Rears map. The story of their work and the conclusions arrived at from their study can be found in this wonderful book. Other old maps known to scholars, such as the so-called Port Portolano charts of the Middle Ages and others, were brought into the research work. The results of the work undertaken by Hatwood and his team indicate that the originals from which the Piri Rias map, dated AD 1513, was compiled must have been made before the last ice age. In order to undertake such a task all that long time ago, the cartographers of that era must have photographed the places on the map from the air. The conclusion must be that some amazing civilization had flying machines and cameras over 10,000 years ago. I'm not advancing this important discovery in support of a physical Atlantis, as no land mass or masses, now under the borders, appear on the Piri Rias map, but it is evidence that a very advanced civilization was around in times before recorded history began, and it is possible that the information for the preparation of the originals that Piri Rias worked from in the making of his own map was handed down from the survivors of the sinking of Posidonis. Earlier in his book, it suggests that Atlantis went under the Atlantic Ocean in a series of three catastrophes spread over millennia. According to Plato, the last island of Atlantis, namely Posidonis, was submerged about 9500 BC, well over 11,500 years ago. However, it is now the consensus of scientific opinion that the last ice age started about 10,000 years ago. In other words, some 1500 years after Posidonis sank beneath the waves. Some parts of the world may not have been so devastatingly affected by this last catastrophe, though I have indicated in this book that it was pretty widespread. It seems a possibility that some survivors from the Atlantean civilization or the descendants provided the material for the originals from which Piri Reese's map was made. In any case, whatever further research discloses, Mallory's discovery of the Piri Reese's map and its potential significance, together with Hapwood's work confirming the implications behind it all, will one day be realised to be of even greater importance than Schleiman's discovery of Troy. The Enigma of Tijuanaco. In this chapter, I propose to devote special attention to what may well be the oldest collection of ruined edifices in the New World. Ancient writers have referred to the Atlanteans as being of gigantic size, and it is important to realise that they built on a titanic or cyclopean scale. In a later chapter, we will be discussing the gigantic tunnel systems built by these amazing people. The ruins at Tijuanaco are an example of this building in a king-sized style. First, it should be stated that Tijuanaco is situated on the Andean Altiplano, at an elevation in excess of 12,500 feet above sea level, close by Lake Titicaca, and not far from the border of Bolivia and Peru. Dealing with the problem of this amazing elevation, Sir Clemens Markham, in the Incas of Peru, wrote, There's a mystery still unsolved on the plateau of Lake Titicaca, which, if stone could speak, would reveal a story of deepest interest. Much of the difficulty in the solution of this mystery is caused by the nature of the region, 
in the present day where the enigma still defies explanation. Then two pages on he added, such a region is only capable of sustaining a scanty population of hardy mountaineers and labourers. The mystery consists in the existence of a great city at the southern side of the lake. Elaborating upon a suggestion advanced by Sir Leonard Darwin, the then president of the Royal Geographical Society in London, that the Titicata Basin has risen appreciably after the erection of the original edifices at Tijuanaco, Sir Clemens remarked, Is such an idea beyond the bounds of possibility? Maize would then ripen in the basin of Lake Titicaca, and the site of the ruins of Tijuanaco would support the necessary population. A fact to remember when arguing along these lines is that the whole character of the local country and the extent of Lake Titicaca would have been different with the consequent difference in climatic conditions. The foremost authority on the Tijuanacan ruins and cultures, Professor Arthur Poznanski, in his book Tijuanaco, The Cradle of American Man, said of this problem, at the present time, the plateau of the Andes is inhospitable and almost sterile. With the present climate, it would not have been suitable in any period as the asylum for great human masses. Today, this region is at a very great height above sea level. In remote times, it was slower. At this point in the argument, I'd like to quote from my book, Man Among Mankind, referring to a major catastrophe effect affecting Atlantis some 15,000 years ago. I postulate in that book, as has been reaffirmed in this one, that the lost continent went down in three stages. These events, coupled with climatic changes, altered the face of the globe. The continuous wrenching, twisting and turning of the Earth in this gargantuan cosmic upheaval with lunar caused faults to form on the face of the world and mountains to rise on its surface. The Rocky Mountains, the Cascade Range and the Andes in the Americas, together with the Himalayas in Asia and the Alps in Europe, were either not there previously or had not achieved anything like their present range of height. Emmanuel Velikovsky wrote that the great massive of the Himalayas rose to its present height in the age of modern, actually historical man. Colonel P.H. Fawcett, who mysteriously disappeared in the Brazilian Mato Grosso during 1925, travelled all over Peru and Bolivia in the first two decades of this century, and came to much the same conclusions about the age of Tijuana. He believed it to have been destroyed by terrible seismic upheavals accompanying the elevation of the Andes to their present height. Harold T. Wilkins, in Mysteries of Ancient South America, concluded that Tijuanaco was of great antiquity and in the following passage associated the ruins with giants. One may be forgiven when contemplating the amazing command of these ancient engineers and masons over vast masses of rock in a way that can hardly be rifled by modern engineers before their wonderful techniques and powerful upper clients for speculating whether they're a race of giants in stature. H.S. Bellamy, in Built Before the Flood, the problem of the Tijuanaco ruins remarked. The measurements of some of the buildings of Tijuanaco are astounding. The fortress of Acapana measures about 650 feet by 100 feet, roughly equal to the area of the Tower of London inside the moat. The outer walls of the great sun temple of Calacasse measure about 440 by 390 feet, roughly equal to the area of, Tra of Trafalgar Square. And those of the Palace of the Black, White and Red Stairs, also called the Palace of the Sarcophagi, measured 220 by 180 feet, roughly equal to the area of Leicester Square, or Leicester, how a few commies pronounce it. All the great buildings of Tijuanaco, except small parts of them, were open to the sky, and evidently gathering places for vast multitudes who met for political, religious and social purposes. One reason for considering that Tijuanaco was built by a race of giants is the fact that there were enormous foundation slabs and in the structures themselves huge blocks were used. No small elements or bricks were involved in the buildings of Tijuanaco. Bellamy considered that this type of architecture was dictated by the exigencies of nature. No mortar was used. The walls were built in such a way as to be extremely solid but also elastic, which would render them to some extent earthquake proof. Incidentally, the walls of some of the Tijuanaco like ruins of Simonaki are as much as 10 feet thick, another factor consistent with the earthquake menace which dictated the way, this way of building. A. H. Beryl and R. Beryl, both of whom visited and surveyed Tijuanaco, state that the largest work block there measures 36 feet by 7 feet and must weigh between 175 and 200 tonnes. Nearly every stone at Tijuanaco is expertly and micro-accurately cut and polished, nicked, mortised and occasionally even bevelled. So astonishing is it that Squire, in Peru, instance of travel and exploration in the land of the Incas, wrote, in no part of the world have I seen stones cut with such mathematical precision and admirable skill as in Peru, and in no part of Peru are there any to surpass those which are scattered over the plains of Tijuana. I'm just going to take a little breather for a moment, just 
put in my own little two bits for two seconds. And that is, is my belief that all of these stones that they're talking about cut to precision were actually made to a certain recipe that they had that secrets to back then, with the main ingredient being the hemp herb, the inner part of the cannabis plant. And when you mix that with lime and local rock dust or local sand or whatever you've got locally available, crushed up rocks, pour into a, a mould, it will appear to be carving and petrified some stone at the time, and I believe it. We've got evidence for this. If you, There's a really interesting one I watched just a couple of days ago about all these intricately carved statues that maybe they were sort of made in something more like um, plasticine with ingredients that then turn into stone over time. They're not intricately carved from a single block of marble. Just thought I'd add that in. <sighs> anyway. Earlier in the chapter, I quoted from one of my earlier books, implying that Tijuanaica was raised to its present position in a catastrophe 15,000 years ago. In that work, I also described the Gate of the Sun at Tijuanaica, which is carved a figure of the sun, surrounded by wind mes winged messengers. There was also sculptured on the gateway a very precise astronomical calendar. Alexandre Kazantsev, the well-known Russian scientist, visited Tijuanaica a few years ago. Incidentally, he discovered, like so many others that have visited the area, that the water in Lake Titicaca is saline and that there are seashells on the beach and traces of an old harbour. All this surely indicates that millennia ago, before the catastrophe that overtook the world, Lake Titicaca and Tijuanaco were at sea level and that the lake was probably a bay or inlet by the sea. However, on digressing from the astronomical calendar on the Gate of the Sun, though it is an important digression, I think you'll agree. As ants have estimated, the Gate of the Sun to have been built between 12,000 and 15,000 years ago. He said that for 15,000 years our Earth has turned on its axis at almost the same rate. Then, if that is the case, he asked, why should this calendar on the Gate of the Sun at Tijuanaco be so different from our known ones? You see, Kazants have discovered that the Tijuanaco calendar shows a set of 290 days, not 365, composed of 12 months, 10 of 24 days, that is 240, and 2 of 25, that is 50, total 290. The Russian scientist stated that Professor Gurov and others have agreed that the calendar on the Gate of the Sun is the oldest in the world. The implications of this are tremendous. If our calendar has remained more or less the same for 15,000 years, and the calendar of Tijuanaco describes a completely different one of 290 days, which I'm told is similar to the Venusian length of a year, then this surely proves that this particular catastrophe happened around 15,000 years ago, as I have been advocating. Tijuanaco today stands high up in the Andes, a lonely memorial to the mysterious race who built those amazing edifices. There is some evidence that the monoliths were not entirely finished when the catastrophe struck and caused the whole city and lake to be raised to a height of 12,500 feet above sea level. Forgive me for repeating this, but the whole thought, as I'm sure you will appreciate, is absolutely staggering. There seems to be a very likely connection between the race of Atlantean giants who built mysterious Tijuanaco and those who erected the 550 colossal stone figures of men looking disdainfully inland on the tall cliffs of Easter Island far away in the Pacific Ocean. Thor Heyerdahl, as the result of his epic voyage from South America to the South Seas on his raft, the Contiki, evidently came to that conclusion. He considered that the race of people who built Tijuanaco were the same race who constructed the fantastic figures on Easter Island, and that they, didn't, that they got to the South Sea in the same way that he did. I'm not sure whether he's correct on the last score, as there's good reason to think that the Atlanteans had flying machines. After all, we pointed out in the last chapter when discussing the fabulous Perry Rios map that those cartographers who compiled the originals from which the map was prepared must have had flying machines to do the work. True, this might have been done three or four thousand years later, but a race of people who are capable of building such wonderful buildings at Tijuanaco, Easter Island and the platform at Baalbek in the Lebanon, and the fantastic tunnel systems we'll be describing later, could well have had flying machines. Indeed, all the legends indicate that they came from outer space. So I doubt if they would have sailed from South America in some kind of raft like Iodal did. This in no way is intended to take any credit away from that splendid man for his great epic voyage and fine seamanship. He certainly proved that they could have done the journey like him that way, but somehow I don't think that the Atlanteans used rafts. They flew through the air with the greatest of ease. Incidentally, the stone edifices on Easter Island were unfinished too, indicating that the builders were involved in, a, in the catastrophe that engulfed the world at that time. 
There's yet another out of this world structure on our planet today, which also goes to illustrate the extraordinary capabilities the ancients possessed in the art of building. I refer to the ruins of Baalbek, which lie at the height of 3,500 feet to the northeast of Beirut in the Lebanon. In Men Among Mankind, I wrote, the Romans built magnificent temples to their gods upon, in the words of Mark Twain, massive substructures that might support a world almost. The material used is blocks of stones as large as an omnibus. I later continued as follows. The massive substructures referred to by Mark Twain, which form the huge platform on which the great temple is built, are truly amazing. He wrote that one stretch of the platform, composed of only three stones, was nearly 200 feet in length. They are 13 feet square, two of them being 64 feet, and the third 69 feet long, and built into the massive wall 20 feet above the ground. It can easily be gathered from the aforementioned data that the stones used at Baalbek were far bigger than anything at Tijuana. In that earlier book from which I've just quoted, I went on the right. No one so far has come up with the answer as to who built the massive platform at Baalbek, upon which the Romans are known to have constructed a very long time afterwards their wonderful temple. Apparently, the platform at Baalbek was not entirely completed either, I wrote. The quarry from which these colossal stones at Baalbek were taken is a quarter of a mile away from the platform at a much lower level. Mark Twain relates how in a pit lay a similar stone, the mate of the largest stone in the ruins. What is more, it lies there, squared and ready for the builder's hands, a solid mass 14 feet by 17 feet wide and 70 feet long. What caused that tremendous block of masonry intended for the great solid black block at Baalbek to be abandoned, leaving the work unfinished? In this chapter, it has been shown that in antediluvian times, there was a great civilization that built tremendous edifices all over the world. The remains of three of these survive today as constant reminders of a former great culture that existed on this planet. Tijuanaco, high up in the Andes, Easter Island in the South Seas, and finally at Baalbek in the Lebanon. In previous books, I've discussed the Great Pyramid in Egypt, Stonehenge, and the remarkable serpentine figures at Avery, similar constructions at Karnak in France, and we could mention the fortress of Cuzco, built with 200 tonne stones. The dates of all these last mentioned edifices are very controversial, though I consider them all to have greater antiquity than is credited to them by orthodox scientists. However, the three we have dealt with in this chapter belong to a great era some millennia ago, and all are irrevocably constructed with a great catastrophe that took place some 15,000 years ago and changed the shape of the world, very much more than did the final catastrophe of 9500 BC related by Plato, which saw the last island of Atlantis, that of Poisonous, sink beneath the ocean. There is increasing evidence that many millennia ago there came to this earth from outer space a race of people who were able to design and build temples, palaces and other edifices in a way that nobody can do today, despite all our modern techniques. They were craftsmen of a very unusual order, descended from the gods. They were the Atlanteans who ruled and civilised who civilised the world of their time. It was truly an incredible age. And they're getting to my favourite bits, giants and titans. The Bible tells us that there was a war in heaven. And there was a war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. And he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. The book of Revelation 13, 7 to 9. It would seem that this was a war on a cosmic scale that must have been a pretty big affair, making our two recent world wars comparatively insignificant, quite puny in fact, that is, if you take the biblical account literally. We do know from another biblical story that the fallen angels, or sons of God, did arrive on earth and were soon busy fraternising and copulating with the daughters of men, Genesis 6, 1 to 2, 4. It would seem that the sons of God, fallen though they may have been, were still capable of using what to the very primitive inhabitants of earth must have seemed like supernatural powers. We've already mentioned earlier that, that there were original gods of the ancient Egyptians, the Phoenicians, and Romans and Greeks. The war that started in heaven continued for long afterwards on earth between the various gods. I think that they were invaded from outer space after they arrived here. And this view is held by Eric von Daniken. We will be discussing his theory in a later chapter. Anyway, conflict went on in a very big way, and for a long time, there was constant battle between various gods. As a result of their interbreeding with these beings who were already on earth, they spawned terrible monsters, and the result was diabolical. 
They also tried to create new forms of life in the underground caverns of the world, and what happened is related in Greek mythology. H. A. Gruber, in his book The Myths of Greece and Rome, referring to the children of Gaia and Uranus, wrote, They had not dwelt long on the summit of Mount Olympus before they found themselves the parents of twelve gigantic children, whose strengths were such that their father, Uranus, greatly feared them. To prevent their ever making use of it against him, he seized them immediately after the birth, hurled them down into a dark abyss called Tartarus, and there chained them fast. These giants were called titans, and we still use the word titanic to describe something of vast size. Thus early did the giant appear in legend. This chasm was situated far under the earth, and Uranus knew that his sons, Oceanus, Cous, Craus, Hyperion, Iapetus, and Cronus, as well as his six daughters, the Titanades, Ilia, Rhea, Themis, Thetis, Menes, Menemosine, Menemosine, and Phoebe, and still easily escape from its cavernous depths. Menemosine. There are constant references throughout Greek mythology to Tartarus or Hades, a place far down under the earth, the prison house of the lower world. It is part of our argument that Atlantis existed <coughs> and that the gods of Greek mythology were originally the kings of Atlantis, later dividing the ten kingdoms that made up the whole empire between them under the overall rule of Zeus. The Atlantic area was given to Poseidon, after whom the island of Poseidonis was named, and the underworld to Pluto. If all these surface kingdoms of Atlantis was considered real by the ancient writers, then why should not the lower world of Tartarus be equally real? I consider the hollow earth to be a fact, and in the second part of this book I will set before you up to date proof. At this stage, we can well study the frequent mention of Tartarus in the legends. It is appreciated that mythology is not a collection of facts, but of myths. However, but all these stories, there may well lie something close to the truth, something so devastating that all our conceptions of the geography of the earth will have to be revised. It is not necessary to go into Greek mythology too deeply here. Suffice it to state that Cronus escaped from Tartarus with the aid of his mother, Gaia, and overcame his father, Uranus, while asleep. He then set free his brothers and sisters and became the new king. His father had cursed him for telling that one day he, Cronus, would in turn be supplanted by his own children. The time came when his wife Rhea gave birth to a son. When Rhea offered him the baby to hold, Cronus, recollecting his father's curse, swallowed the child while Rhea looked on in horror. Each time Rhea had a child, it would meet with the same fate. Finally, when Zeus, her youngest, was born, she decided to trick her husband. She placed a large stone in swaddling clothes and offered it to Cronus, who swallowed it. Meanwhile, Rhea, who had arranged for Zeus to be looked after by the Melian nymphs, who hid in a cave on Mount Ida. Subsequently, when Zeus was a grown man, he attacked and overcame his father in a terrific struggle. Cronus was given a special potion prepared by Metis, the daughter of Oceanus. This caused him to vomit up the children and the stone that he had swallowed. Zeus gave his brothers and sisters a share of his domain, and some of the titans, notably Oceanus, Hyperion and Themis gave their allegiance to the new king. However, the others would not have Zeus as their king, and so began a der terrible conflict, the revolt of the Titans. The Titans began a furious attack on Mount Olympus. Zeus, realising that he was outnumbered, released the Cyclopes and the Hecatonchires, who had also been languishing in Tartarus. The Cyclopes agreed to let him have thunderbolts, weapons which they knew how to make. There is something here very reminiscent of 20th century, 20th century warfare. And the Hecatonchires put their hundred-handed arms at his disposal. I'm wondering if this story has not got a little distorted while being passed on to us by the ancient Greeks who did not have the modern weapons that we do today. The ancients were passing on legends of their gods who lived thousands of years before them. This is pure speculation, but I'm wondering if the Hecaton Kiris had got the ability to construct something like giant tanks which are armed with 100 guns or weapons. Lasers. The war lasted for 10 long years. Zeus himself took part, hurling thunderbolts incessantly. The Titans were eventually overcome, and some of them were flung into Tartarus once more. Zeus had scarcely overcome the Titans when he found himself involved in a new war, this time against the giants. These giants had apparently been conceived, according to the story, in the blood of the mutilated Uranus. I shall have some ideas of my own to give you later about this. These new giants were terrible to behold. They had legs like serpents and their feet consisted of the heads of snakes. They attacked Mount Olympus in force, tearing up mountains and piling them one on the other. However, the Olympians stood their ground. It was eventually due to a semi-divine mortal, Hercules, who managed to defeat the giant 
about Chionius that the battle was won. It's very important to note that these particular giants were monstrous mutants. Finally, Gaia made one more effort on behalf of her Titan children. According to the Larousse Encyclopedia of Mythology, Gaia, they spell it G-A-E-A, -E that's what I'm pronouncing it, Gaia, not Gaia, however, would not resign herself to the defeat of her children. Against Zeus, she raised up a final monster, Typhoeus, who, who she had born to Tartarus. There is no such person as Tartarus. It is the name of the underworld prison house, sometimes called Hades. The above quotation is a clear indication that this monster was manufactured in Tartarus. At first, Zeus stood firm against this dreadful monster, but he was taken prisoner by Typhoeus. Typhoeus. And kept captive in Cilicia. After being rescued by Hermes, Zeus finally overcame the monster by using his thunderbolts with great skill. After this, peace came to the world. Zeus was now truly in command. As mentioned earlier, he divided up his realm amongst his brothers and looked after all these areas as a kind of supreme emperor. Did these mythological events take place? Obviously, the myths have got distorted in many ways and mixed up as a result of all the terrible cataclysms that overcame the earth many millennia ago. However, there is a saying that where there is smoke, there is fire. And in my opinion, there does seem to be an awful lot of smoke. Obviously, some of the very clearly very early myths relating to Uranus and Cronus deal with the creation of the world. However, the subsequent stories covering the wars of the giants and titans may well have been colossal holocausts that took place in Atlantis. Furthermore, the thunderbolts and suggestions of other advanced weapons add a note of reality to these legends. I think that after Zeus finally defeated all his enemies, the golden age of Atlantis set in and probably lasted for thousands of years. It would be interesting to question here the actual dating of the bearded white man who came from Atlantis to Central and South America to civilise the natives of those countries and pass on to them some of the Atlantean culture. Did they perform their missions before the catastrophe of 15,000 years ago, which destroyed Tijuana and caused the work at Easter Island and Baalbek to be abandoned? I think that they did. The Atlanteans, by all accounts, prior to the submergence of Posidonis in 9500 BC, had gradually got very materialistic and aggressive leading to their war against the ancient Greeks, described by Diodorus, a Roman writer. While this conflict was taking place, the catastrophe ensued. The Greek army was swallowed up into the earth and Posidonis sank under the waters. The war between the Atlanteans and the Greeks was no invention on the part of Diodo Diodorus, as accounts of it were in circulation centuries before his time. It should by now be clear that the wars of the giants and the titans, and the final one against the ancient Greeks, were all part of the history of Atlantis. Although a great deal of the story of these terrible conflicts is shrouded in the myths of both antiquity and mythology, the basic picture can be discerned, albeit dimly. The result is a long panoramic narrative in the form of legends and myths telling us of gods that came from outer space, who ruled over Atlantis and were the progenitors of our own civilization. They also fought terrible wars and in the underground world of Tartarus made grotesque monsters and giants with reptilian legs that turned on the gods themselves. Okay, I'm just going to take a two-second break because it's beer o'clock. Cheers. Stout pine. Oh, I hate it myself. One out of four. Let's keep going. It'll be dark shortly. Atlantean tunnel systems. The awe-inspiring megalithic buildings around the world erected by the Atlanteans have already been discussed. In writing about Tijuanaco, stress was laid on the fact that the city was constructed in an unusual manner to make it earthquake-proof. The world in those far-off days was physically very unstable. For this reason, too, the Atlanteans built fantastic tunnel systems in which refuge could be taken if necessary. 
from both the onslaughts of nature and attacks from outer space. Eric von Daniken, in his remarkable book, The Gold of the Gods, tells of a gigantic system of tunnels thousands of miles in length, extending underneath Ecuador and Peru. This system of both interlinking caves and tunnels was discovered by Jan Marix in 1965. Von Daniken related that a tunnel led into a huge hall where there were stone and metal objects, including statues of many kinds of animals made of solid gold. Furthermore, there was a metal library consisting of metal plaques, leaves, with writing on them in an unknown language, which Marix thinks may contain a history of humanity and details about a vanished civilization. Von Daniken stated that the tunnels under Ecuador and Peru have walls that are smooth and often seem to be polished. He realised that these tunnels had not been hacked out with axes, but constructed by much more sophisticated means. In his book, he suggested that the builders of the tunnels used a combination of thermal drills and electron ray guns. In Von Daniken's words, If the drill came up against some exceptionally hard geological strata, these could be blasted by a few well-aimed shots with the gun. Then the armoured thermal drill would attack the resulting blocks and heat the massive debris to the liquid state. As soon as the liquid rock cooled down, it would form a diamond-hard blaze. The tunnel system would be safe against infiltration by water and supports for the chamber would be superfluous. Towards the end of his book, von Daniken put forward a most interesting theory concerning a specific reason as to why the tunnels were built. This is something quite apart from the dangers of seismic activity which I have already covered and was a very real threat too. He suggested in remote times a cosmic battle took place among the people who look very much like ourselves. The losers apparently, losers apparently got away in a spaceship. Personally, I would have credited them with more than one spaceship, but that is probably carping a bit unnecessarily. He then mentions that the gas masks the losers wore and what was to them our different atmosphere, and refers to the various helmets and breathing apparatus seen in cave dwellings. Von Daniken then stated that the victors, those that remained on this planet, burrowed deep into the earth and made the tunnel systems out of fear of their pursuers who were equipped with every kind of technical aid. Then, to throw their opponents completely off the track, they set up broadcasting stations on the fifth planet of our solar system, then existing between Mars and Jupiter. These stations kept sending out coded reports. The enemy, von Daniken suggested, fell for this ruse and destroyed the fifth planet with a terrific explosion. The debris from the exploded planet spread to what is now called the asteroid belt. This area consists of thousands of asteroids and small lumps of stones. As von Daniken puts it, planets do not explode by themselves. Someone makes them explode. I think that this is the most fascinating and plausible concept, and it would seem that the weapons used in those very remote times were even more lethal than in our own day and age. In this connection, I'm wondering what those thunderbolts really were that Zeus and the other gods tossed around. Peter Colissimo in Timeless Earth writes of a tunnel system connecting Lima to Cozco, and from there continuing to the Bolivian border. He wrote, Apart from the lure of gain, these tunnels present a fascinating archaeological problem. Scholars agree that they were not made by the Incas themselves who used them but were ignorant of their origin. They are in fact so imposing that it does not seem absurd to conjecture, as some scientists have done, that they are the handiwork of an unknown race of giants. Harold T. Wilkins, in his book Mysteries of Ancient South America, was probably describing the same tunnel system when he stated, One of the approaches to the Great Tunnel lay, and still lies, near Old Cuzco, but it is masked beyond discovery. This hidden approach leads directly into an immense subterranean which runs from Cuzco to Lima as the crow flies a distance of 380 miles. Then, turning southwards, the Great Tunnel extends into what, until about 1868, was modern Bolivia, around 900 miles. Wilkins also referred to some tunnels in the West Indies. Similar strange tunnels of incredibly ancient date and unknown origin in the West Indies were brought to the attention of Christopher Columbus when he visited Martinique. No doubt the white Atlantean race built splendid cities in what are now West Indian islands, but which, at that far off date, may have formed part of what is a now submerged Middle American continent, whose name is commemorated in the word Antilles. A curious tradition of the old world of Asia is that old Atlantis has a network of labyrinthine tunnels and passages running in all directions. In a day when the land bridge between the ground island, ground land and Africa on one side and old Brazil on the other existed. In Atlantis, the tunnels were used for necromantic and black magic cults. Colisimo pointed out that the tunnel systems are to be found all over the world. Apart from South America, he listed California, Virginia, Hawaii, Oceania and Asia. 
in Europe, there are tunnels in Sweden and Czechoslovakia, and in the Mediterranean area, in the Balearics and Malta. He added, a huge tunnel, some 30 miles of which have been explored, runs between Spain and Morocco, and many believe that this is how the Barbary apes, which are otherwise unknown in Europe, reached Gibraltar. Indeed, Colosimo wrote, it has even been suggested that these cyclopean galleries form a network connecting the most distant parts of our planet. Easter Island has already been mentioned in regard to the enigmatic figures on the cliffs, but who constructed the tunnels that lead out under the sea and for what purpose? Wilkins has more to tell us about the ancient tunnel systems. Among the Mongolian tribes of Inner Mongolia, even today, there are traditions about tunnels and subterranean worlds which sound as fantastic as anything in modern novels. One legend, if it be that, says that the tunnels lead to a subterranean world of antediluvian descent somewhere in a recess of Afghanistan or in the region of the Hindu Kush. It's even given a name, Agati. This legend adds that a labyrinth of tunnels and underground passages is extended in a series of links connecting Agati with all other subterranean worlds. The subterranean world, it is said, is lit by a strange green luminescence which favours the growth of crops and is conducive to length of days and health. This last account is of special interest as Colissimo refers to this green fluorescence in another part of the world. He writes in Timeless Earth about a strange bottomless well in Azerbaijan in the Soviet Union. Apparently a bluish light comes from its wall and odd noises are heard. Eventually, after investigating and exploring, scientists found a whole system of tunnels connecting with other ones in Georgia and all over the Caucasus. After describing these tunnels, which are regular in form, and he stated almost identical similar ones in Central America, Colosimo went on to tell us that they are part of a huge system even connecting with Iran and moreover with the tunnels of China, Tibet and Mongolia. Now, referring back to Wilkins' account of a subterranean world called Agati, which is said to be lit by a strange green, green luminescence, Colissimo had this to say. The Tibetans believe that the tunnels are citadels, the last of which still afford refuge to the survivors of an immense cataclysm. This unknown people is said to make use of an underground source of energy which replaces that of the sun, causing plants to breed and prolonging human life. It's supposed to give out a green fluorescence, and it's curious that we also meet with this idea in American nature. In the latter part of this book, we will be relating the strange story of the green children of the wolf pits, which may have a special bearing on what I've just been told. Anyway, enough has been written here to indicate that the Atlanteans built tunnel systems all over the world for various purposes. Firstly, to protect themselves from the then very common onslaughts of nature in the form of seismic activity and floods, and secondly, as a protection if attacked from outer space. Most of these fantastic tunnels were constructed in ways beyond our present capabilities. For years, England and France have been talking about the idea of a channel tunnel. However, it seems that the ancients built these amazing tunnels in their era as a matter of course, and on a very large scale, for good and imperative reasons. The Great Catastrophe oh, Sit up there. Pull down my throat. In the first chapter, it was shown that large land masses existed in the Atlantic until comparatively recent geological times. Now, let us focus our searchlight on the very large corpus of legends, traditions, and myths describing the cataclysmic events attending the submergence of these lands. Lest it be objected at the beginning that this kind of material is capable of diverse interpretation and therefore a little scientific worth, I would point out that had written records of the same events come down to our day, from the very year of the occurrences, those documents would not be regarded as fanciful or valueless and would be highly treasured items in some great library. Plato's account was written some 9,000 years after the event. The very nature and scope of the catastrophe occupation was to survive, and most of their energies were directed at finding or building suitable habitations growing or finding food and reorganising their existence. In Men Among Mankind, referring to this terrible catastrophe, catastrophe, I wrote, The population of the world after this series of catastrophes was very small. Those that were left had been driven almost insane and reduced to a state where little more, they were little more than terrified animals. They never knew when another violent paroxysm of the earth might occur, causing hot lava to wrap out of cavities, tidal waves to overwhelm them or earthquakes to swallow them up. Most of the survivors, because of the state of their minds and the hopelessness for some time after the catastrophe, trying to establish themselves in any particular place, 
wandered about the earth seeking their food or wherever it could be found. They are reduced to wandering, hunting and fishing state. Therefore, there can scarcely have been many opportunities to put pen to paper or hammer to stone, assuming that the survivors had such luxuries with them, and to have prepared a written account of the great event. Most of the survivors, shocked and preoccupied with maintaining their own existence, probably could not even write, although a system of writing is known to have existed in anti-delusion times. And thus, through a combination of these circumstances, memories of the terrible calamity which had befallen early man and his animal companions was transmitted to posterity in the form of oral traditions and legends. Colonel Brahini, whom we have mentioned previously in The Shadow of Atlantis, observed on this matter. The French scientist Glotz, in his speaks in the history of Greece, of the role of myths in historical research as follows. It is a well-known fact that legend comes before history, but an attentive and rigorous analysis of any myth gives us the opportunity to detect historical data even in a myth. The comparative method is very useful in these cases. Adopting this procedure, I now intend to cite a large number of legends which can only refer to the great catastrophe, which brought the place to sign period to an end. Pleistocene period. Dr. H. H. Bancroft's five-volume treatise, The Native Races of the Pacific States of North America. We find the following information. The pre-Columbian tribes of Nicaragua, the Guatemalan Mixtecs, the Pimas and the Patagos all possessed a legend of a world deluge. The Matolis, a tribe of California, regard Taylor Peak as the point in which their forefathers took refuge from a great and destructive flood. The Chipperoyans say the deluge covered all the earth except the highest mountain tops, upon which many people were saved. While the Thlinkeets relate that many people accepted the deluge by seeking shelter in a great floating building. This, of course, has great interest when compared with Noah's Ark in Genesis. However, there are many similar stories from all over the world relating to this catastrophic period. A Brazilian deluge legend describing how all humanity, excepting one man and his sister, was drowned, was mentioned by an unknown Portuguese chronicler who visited South America about 1815-1990. The work is called A Treatise on Brazil, written by Portugal, which had a long lived there, but it is referred to in Aclutus Posthumus, or Purchase His Pilgrims, containing a history of the world of in sea voyages and land travels by Englishmen and others by Samuel Purchase. In the old world, there are numerous deluge legends. One is connected with the myth of the hero Dardanos, who is reported to have crossed the Trode on a raft at the time of that event. The Greek hero Deucalion and his wife Pyra survived the deluge, and he was subsequently known as the hero of the universal flood. One of the best collections of traditions relating to the catastrophe is that found in H.S. Bellamy's book, Moons, Myths and Man, a reinterpretation. Bellamy wrote, Less universal than the deluge myths, though not less striking, are the reports of a great fire which swept over the earth as part of the great cosmic catastrophe which also caused the great flood. Bellamy then tells us how the Nipkumpakamok, or Thompson River Indians, now settled in the Thompson River region of British Columbia and Canada, speak of a time when their ancestors witnessed a tremendous flood which quenched a great fire that raged over the world. The Gross Ventures tribe of Montana say that the god Nikant destroyed the world first through fire and then through water. Another of those great myths describes how the flood was sent to quench a great fire which had charred all the world. The Cato Indians of California say the old world was bad and needed recreating. Accordingly, the mountains were set on fire. The thunder god, who lives in the world above, extinguished the conflagration with a flood of hot water. Then it began to rain night and day until the waters covered the greater part of the earth. The Wintun Indians of the Sacramento area of California have a legend in which it is said that when the God Kachila had his magic flint stolen and sent in his wrath a great fire from the heavens which burnt all the earth. Then he poured down a great flood to put out the fire. Washoe Indians, another Californian tribe, tell of a great terrestrial revolution which caused the mountains to blaze up in flames so high that even the stars melted and fell on earth. Then the Sierras rose up from the plains while other parts of the country were inundated. This sequence of events is exactly what called for by modern geology, the youthful origin of most of the world's mountain systems being fully attested to by modern geological discoveries. Additionally, Emmanuel Velikovsky has already been quoted in an earlier chapter at, at this point. See also R. F. Link's work, Glacial Geology and the Pleistocene Epoch author. In South America, the Arawaks of Guyana, formerly British Guyana, say that the wickedness of antediluvian mankind was so dreadful that the creator, Aomon Kondi, who lives in heaven, twice ordered a general destruction. First he scourged the world with fire, then he flooded it with water. A 
Few men, however, contrived to escape both catastrophes, finding refuge from the fall of fiery rain in underground caverns, while at the time of great flood, the ancestral Arawak chief, Mararawana, and his followers were able to escape in a canoe. Ignatius Donnelly, in his Ragnarok, The Age of Fire and Gravel, quoted the following previous legend. The profligacy of mankind had provoked the great supreme to send a pestilential wind upon the earth. The pure poison descended, every blast was dead. At this time, the patriarch, distinguished for his integrity, was shut, together with his select company, in the enclosure which was strong within the strong door of the cave. Here the just ones were safe from inquiry. Presently the tempest of fire arose. It split the earth asunder to the great deep. The lake Leon burst its bounds, and the waves of the sea lifted themselves on high around the borders of Britain. The rain poured down from heaven, and the waters covered the earth. A very early Irish legend, mentioned by R. H. Mottram in his book Noah, to the flood. 150 women and three men led by Banba, one of the ancient poetical names given to Ireland, landed in Ireland before the flood. After they had been 40 years on the land, a plague fell on them so that they all died within a week. 200 years after that, Erin was a desert, empty without anyone alive in it. After that came the flood. It is remarkably significant that the number 40 in the above legend is assigned as the length of the pre-plague period in Ireland especially as the same figure occurs frequently in legends from other sources describing, or in some way associated with, the deluge, as in Genesis. Moreover, it is curious that knowledge of Banba's Irish colony should have come down to us if, as we are told, all the members died of the plague and Ireland was destitute of human beings for 200 years. Perhaps this particular legend has got a little of the old Blarney in it. The number 40, like the numbers 3 and 7, always has was invested by the ancients with special magical or sacred significance. Mottram mentioned numerous deluge traditions in which a recognisable equivalent of Noah is to be found. For example, in the Hindu version, Mottram said that the sacred Vedas were stolen by the giant Hayagriva, an act which brought a universal deluge. Before the arrival of the flood, however, the good king Satyayorata, the Hindu deluge hero, was told by the god Vishnu to expect a ship which would come in time to save him in his court. Mottram wrote, in this case, the rain came first for seven days, and then on the crest of the flood, already mounting, appeared the fabulous and ready-to-hand ship. And in this case alone, there's some attempt to account for the means of propulsion, and it's a characteristically eastern account. The god Vishnu came in the form of a fish, a million times long, with an immense horn, to which the pious king made the ship fast. And it was drawn for many years, the night of Brahma, and at length landed upon the highest peak of Mount Hunaban. Mottram compared this last account of several ancient Egyptian equivalents of Noah and the flood, and recorded that in the ancient Babylonian narrative, Noah is called Hasisadra or Exisithrus, Exisithrus, the tenth king of the old Babylonian king lists. Ancient pre Columbian equivalents of Noah listed by Mottram were Cox Cox, Teokipakli, and Tezpi. Concerning Tezpi, M. Chaburon and his interesting books, Anna Huac, a tale of a Mexican journey, wrote, At that time the waters covered the earth. Then Tesby, as they called him, escaped on a boat full of all sorts of animals and creatures. After a long time he let loose a vulture, but it did not return. He stayed to feed on the dead bodies of giants, revealed by the falling waters. Then a hummingbird, a huitzitzla, was sent out, and it brought back a branch in its beak. The foregoing story certainly shows very great similarities to the Genesis narrative of Noah and the Flood. Some interesting South American flood traditions were collected in 1572 by Sarmiento de Kiboa, who, referring to some pre-Incan accounts, wrote, The Incas believed that after the, the creation, Tiki Viracocca sent a great flood to punish the sins of the first men, but the ancestors of the Cuscos and some other nations were saved and so left some descendants. When the flood was over, Viracocca suddenly appeared on the Titicaca Plateau with servants to help restore mankind and give them light. M.F. Dennis recorded a Brazilian legend as long ago as 1550, when in Un Brasiliani Celebre Eruan and 1550, I don't speak Brazilian, <laughs> he wrote, Monan, without beginning or end, author of all that is, seeing the ingratitude of men and their contempt for him who had made them thus joyous, withdrew from them and sent upon them Tata, the divine fire that burned all that was on the surface of the earth. He swept about the fire in such a way that in places he raised mountains, and in others dug valleys. Of all men, one alone, Iron Mage, was saved. 
whom Monan carried into heaven. He, seeing all things destroyed, spoke thus to Monan, Wilt thou also destroy the heavens and their garniture? Alas, henceforth where will be our home? Why, sh why should I live, since there is none of the other of my kind? Then Monan was so filled with pity, that he poured a deluging rain on the earth, which quenched the fire, and flowed on all sides, forming the oceans, which we call the Piranha, the great waters. This cataclysmic event extended all over the world. A Chinese account, published many years ago by Padre Martin Martinius, in the history of China, reads, The pillars of heaven were broken. The earth shook to its foundations. The sky sank lower towards the north. The sun, moon, and stars changed their motions. The earth fell to pieces. The waters in its bosom uprushed with violence and overflowed. The system of the universe was totally discorded. Man had rebelled against the high gods. The sun went into eclipse, the planets altered their courses, and the grand harmony of nature was disturbed. In the early part of this chapter, I stated I was going to adopt the comparative method advocated by the French scientist Galotz, cited by Rohini, who detect histori historical data in myths. A large number of instances have been given from different parts of the world, all telling much the same story, that a terrible catastrophe overtook the planet in antediluvian times, bringing in some great fires, followed by widespread floods, causing most of the population to be wiped out. In many of these stories, as you've seen, certain good people were saved, and many of the tales have similarities to the Genesis narrative. So it seemed that as a result of following the comparative method, when all these worldwide incidences are considered, and all these myths and legends are taken into account, and there are very, very many more, historical data can be perceived. A worldwide catastrophe most certainly did take place. As to the myths and legends themselves, it is hardly possible to improve on the summary of their value and importance published in 1887 by Sir Henry H. Howarth in his book, The Mammoth and the Flood. I do not profess to have collected all the deluge legends occurring among all races, but I have a sufficient number to show how widespread the tradition is and in how many shapes it occurs, showing that it is not due to it having spread from a common focus, but that the stories are independent. I do not want to exaggerate the importance of this kind of testimony. I only place it alongside of that which I have adduced from another field altogether to show how consistent along the whole line the evidence is, induction from paleontology and archaeology compelling the same conclusion as the legendary myths and stories of the scattered children of men. All point unmistakably, it seems to me, to a widespread catastrophe involving a flood on the great scale. And that I'll try and finish the first part. I think this is the last chapter. Hades or Tartarus. There are many references in classic mythology, the Bible, the folklore of various races, to an underworld variously called Hades, Hell and Tartarus. It is my contention that this lower world is very real and real, and its occupants exert a tremendous influence upon the surface dwellers today. At this stage, I wish to bring to your attention the many attempts to manufacture different forms of life in Tartarus by a mad scientist, no less a person than Satan, sometimes called Satanaku or Pluto. You will recall that after defeating the Titans, Zeus had to contend with the giants. According to mythology, they had been conceived from the blood of the mutilated Uranus. In an earlier chapter, I mentioned that some ideas would be given about this. Those giants were terrible mutants with reptilian legs and feet consisting of serpent heads. They had many other unpleasant features which need not be enlarged upon here. I think that is already quite plain, that they are not exactly the sort of people you would like to meet socially. It seems to me that over the very long passage of time, this story has come down to us in distorted form. Now, the implication comes quite true, quite clearly, taking into account other examples of abominations being manufactured in Tartarus. In short, when mythology relates that those giants were conceived from the blood of the mutilated Uranus, this is another way of telling us that those horrible mutants were made in the underworld of Tartarus. We've already referred to the story of the monster Typhoeus that Gaia had borne to Tartarus, which is the clear indication that it was made by satanic forces in the underground caverns, caverns of Saturnaku. Harold T. Wilkins, in his Secret Cities of Old South America, quoting from the remarkable book Al Dowd, wrote, In Atlan, the secret caverns of Sakamaku were filled with abominations created by his awful wickedness. The lowlands of Atlantis were thoroughly infected and infested with black magic, and the sacred heights were no longer needed for the elders 
or Boom and Adam mix. It was the magic of yellow, red, and black rebels. There is really no such thing as magic. What is termed magic consists of a series of unusual manipulations of natural forces or laws known only to a few initiates. The results, highly extraordinary from the point of view of the vast, ignorant masses, were duly thought of as supernatural or magical. There are reasons for thinking that the devil or Satan was a titan. Since we know that Isis, wife of Ra and Osiris, was, with other contemporaries, reputedly versed in all medical cures and is even credited with performing elaborate surgery to restore the slain Osiris to a further, though limited, span of life. It does not seem to be beyond the bounds of reason to suppose that his medical knowledge was also possessed by the Titans. That being so, it is also reasonable to suppose that the Titans, and perhaps Satan, Tatanaku, who may have been especially interested in surgery and medicine, carried out medical experiments. Such experiments would have been far beyond the can of the mass of humanity in those times and would accordingly have been considered magic. In the late 1920s, Waldemar Jolzrad discovered in Mexico thousands of figurines ranging in height from two inches to six feet, buried deep under sand and volcanic lava. He spent the next 20 years digging up some 66,000 of these fantastic figurines. Many of these figurines were of snakes, giraffes, and other animals. However, a large percentage were of hybrid forms. Some of them depicted beings that were half human and half animal. Others were of monsters devouring humans. Some depicted giants tearing the limbs off humans. The Giles Road figurines have been examined by many scientists, including Professor Charles H. Hapgood, who mentioned earlier and are known to date more than 9,000 years ago. The figurines have been modelled very carefully and are so realistic that they must have been based upon actual events and experiments that were taking place at the time, or in very recent memory of the unknown artists. Most of them are highly malevolent. malevolent. A friend of mine, Mr. J.B. Delaire, was in touch with the late Waldemir Jolzrod, who gave him some of the figurines. I've seen a few myself and can vouch for their bestial and horrible realistic appearance. Author. The discovery of this vast number of figurines is surely very strong proof of what went on in Satanaku's underground caverns. Were there abominations in secret caverns of old Atlan by Satanaku, attempts at surgery going on, or endeavours to create some new kinds of life? Was the manufacture by Satan of a new form of creature the cause of his pride? Had he achieved, perhaps, in horrific form what nobody else, not even Zeus, had managed before? How else can the facts, wild and scattered as some of them are, be rationally explained? Remember, too, that vivisection and diabolical surgery were conducted on animals and human beings by Nazi fanatics within human memory. After the final cataclysm, horrific monsters appeared from the bowels of the earth, probably because seismic activity smashed some of the subterranean caverns and those terrible creatures escaped to the surface. These are mentioned in Greek mythology and they were finally destroyed by the heroes. Those monsters killed by such heroes as Heracles, Jason, Bellerophon, Cadmus, Theseus, Beowulf, Sigurd and others all seem to have been, one, unique in form and two, relatively few in number. There are at least some grounds for believing that Satan was possibly a medical scientist, fanatical to an impossible degree by present day thinking in his desire to manufacture new forms of life. Here we go to any extremes in order to achieve his ends. In short, though, he undoubtedly had godlike powers on the basis of what I've just written. He was a mad scientist. H.E. Gwerber, in his book The Myths of Greece and Rome, describes the ruler of Tartarus in these words. Pluto is always represented as a stern, dark, bearded man with tightly closed lips, a crown on his head, a scepter and a key in hand to show how carefully he guards those who enter his domain and how vain are their hopes to an effect an escape. No temples were dedicated to him, and statues of this god are very rare. Human sacrifices were sometimes offered on his altars, and at his festivals held every hundred years, and thence called secular games, none but black animals were slain. His kingdom, generally called Hades, was very difficult of access. Traditionally, Hades had four rivers flowing through it, and further reference to these will be made later in this book. Whoever names them as the Styx, the Acheron, the Phlegaton, and the Coxetus. Cocytus. The great poet Alighieri Dante, AD 1265-1321, his major work, The Commedia, which is now known as the Divine Comedy, relates how he was escorted by Virgil through the two lower worlds, Hell and Purgatory. An article in the Encyclopedia, Encyclopedia Britannica referring to Dante's description of Hell stated, Hell is conceived as a vast comical, conical hollow reaching to the centre of the earth. 
This is very interesting in view of what will be put forward in the next part of the book as proofs for a hollow earth. It is not suggested by this author that Dante actually descended into the centre of the earth. The Divine Comedy is a great imaginative poem in which the poet plays a leading role himself. However, it does show how ingrained in the minds of the ancients, even the early Christians, was the concept of hell or Hades situated in the centre of the earth. Another interesting point concerns Jesus. It will be recorded that according to the Bible, just prior to his ascension, Jesus descended into hell. There is no doubt that the ancient Greeks and other nations believed in actual, real, physical underworld. Later on, theologists regarded it as a non-physical place you might be dispatched to after death instead of heaven if you did not come up to scratch. It is the purpose of this book to prove that this underworld really existed and still does today. Once again, there is no smoke without fire, and I believe that there is a lot of smoke. Before Posidonis and the last great island of Atlantis sank beneath the waves, the old empire of the sun had lost its original stature and the great civilization had degenerated through the use of black magic. Some of the Atlanteans may have escaped in spaceships, others had gone eastwards and westwards away from the mother country, hoping to escape from the catastrophe, and survived on the surface to give us our present civilization. Most of them, however, took refuge in the tunnel systems connecting with the hollow earth, and their descendants are still there today, living in fabulous cities inside our planet. All this may sound incredible to us mundane surface dwellers. Nevertheless, in the next part of this book, proof will be given that the earth is really hollow. Fasten your, fasten your seat belts for a flight into the centre of the earth through the polar entrance. So I'm up to part two, the case for hollow earth. I'm not going to go any further. I'm just going to stop it there for now. Um, I'll read the next part tomorrow, perhaps. Um, fascinating book. As I say, I just like to read stuff to entertain it. I don't necessarily believe any of it. But I find all mythology very interesting, and as he said, that the case for, you know what he called it, finding other bits of evidence is very strong. But, um, when I sort of associate this with what I think about the flat earth reality, I find it very, very interesting. And the next part will be what I find even more interesting to come up with perhaps an even more incredible view of the flat earth that we have met, never even considered before, or some have considered. And um, we'll go from there. Anyway, have a great day. And, um, I'll see you next time.